Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thanks so much again for joining us today. Um, this is the third in our uh, series of webinars and we intend to continue doing them for the foreseeable future. We've got four great speakers today and Katie will be introducing them later on. Just a very quick intro to me. My name is Sylvia Tidy Harris. I'm the MD of the Speakers Agency and we've been going since 2001. In fact, today I was just looking on LinkedIn and saw something <laughs> on there today about setting up a new business. And when I think back to when we started up, it was a similar environment to today in that the world is not the normal place that we think it is. And we started on September the 1st, 2001, which was 10 days before 9-11. And I think that when you start a business, you can start it any time if you're prepared and ready to go for it. But that takes me back just reading that today. And um, the speakers agency has gone from strength to strength. We supply speakers to all kinds of clients across the UK, Europe and the world. And they our clients literally represent all sorts of organizations from WIs right through to the big global conglomerates. And um, we supply speakers, event hosts, moderators, panel curators, and facilitators to all sorts of people. And uh, we're looking forward to keeping these webinars going. And I'm going to hand over to Katie, who's going to host today as usual. Thank you, Katie. Well done, Sylvia. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Lovely to see lots of friendly, smiling faces. So this is how it's going to work. We have four speakers. I'm going to introduce Sonia in a moment, and then Harry, then myself, and then Maxine. So after the four of us have given our overviews, we're not pitching, but we're giving you a flavor of us as people, of the kind of engaging speeches that we give, whether that's after dinner, presentations, whatever that might be. So I think the main, one of the main messages is, as you can see, we're doing this in a virtual environment. We don't know when we'll be back to work in the office at big events, um, at private dinners for your clients and so on. So the fact is we're giving you a flavor of how this works in a virtual environment. One of the questions we had on one of the previous sessions like this a few weeks back was, I have six weeks and I need to organize a huge virtual conference. Are you there? Are you able to deliver conference speeches virtually? Yes, we are. So we wanted to do that for you today, give you a flavor of what we can deliver, the content, the styles that we all use, which are all very different, but equally compelling. And then at the end of the four speeches, we will come back and then zoom into two breakout rooms. My colleague Ashley will put you into one of two breakout rooms. So about 12 people in each room. And myself and Maxine will be in breakout room one. And Sonia and Harry um, and Sylvia will be in the other. And then after 10 minutes, where you'll have an opportunity to go on video, be unmuted and ask questions, we'll then switch so Maxine and I will go to the other meeting room and Sonia and Harry and Sylvia will go into the other. So you'll get access to all four of the speakers and to Sylvia, which is probably the best bit really, because that's your chance to ask questions based on what you've heard, but equally your opportunity to do a bit of networking and to maybe share some of the major challenges that you have at the moment as well in this really difficult, surreal time that we're living in. So that's the format. As I say, you're all muted for the moment, but you'll be unmuted when we go into the breakouts. And so let me kick everything off by introducing our first speaker today, um, who is Sonia Beldum. Sonia is one of the creative brains behind An Idiot Abroad. Uh, with Ricky Gervais, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, absolutely incredible, Carl Pilkington, Stephen Merchant, um, with some co-stars, you know, co cast stars, such as David Walliams, Julian Clary, Victoria Wood, Harry Bikers, um, and many, many more. So she's a creator also of the hit mental health blog, which is called Sonia's Mum, which highlights the issues of growing up with a hilarious but often hugely embarrassing mum whose mental illness wasn't fully diagnosed until she's 80 years old. So I'm dying to hear more about that. I've got bipolar in our family and people with anxiety. And I know it's a, a huge problem, particularly in lockdown at the moment. So really interested to hear what Sonia has to say. She's also um, a business mentor for women um, in developing countries around the world via the Sherry Blair Foundation. 
and also adding to many skills she's writing two tv dramas at the moment and a children's book where do you find the time sonia and her most recent hobby uh, which is driving a classic route master bus all around london so uh, amazing sonia we're dying to hear more from you so over to you for the first session Oh, lovely. Oh, thank you. That's, oh, I, I do have an interesting life, don't I? You, know, you when do. When you hear it out like that, you think, wow, I do quite a lot of things. Um, well, the lovely, glorious thing about lockdown, of course, is that you can spend a bit of time prioritising the things you really, really love. Um, and the work becomes quite easy to contain. Um, and Sylvia and I actually met each other um, when I was working in the TV industry. So uh, we'd often be talking about really interesting people to go on the television. Um, my background, as you know, is in TV, creative ideas. Um, I love coming up with thoughts that, um, say there's a subject that's pretty boring and I'll come up with a way to make it interesting. So like, I have no interest in cars at all, apart from whether they go and vaguely what colour they are. And, and I went to the BBC and, um, and I had an idea, I just had a title called Panic Mechanics and I thought, what would I do with that? Oh, uh, two teams create wonderful cars out of old bangers you know we put it through and luckily that got commissioned and that was that was the start of my tv career so i used to get all these lovely boring subjects to make programs out of to make them entertaining and that really stems back to a life with a mother with um let's put it this way a creative attitude to the world uh, my mum was fantastic she was five foot one beautiful long ginger hair feisty um size 10 anything other than what i am um and she had the most fantastic creative freedom so she would embarrass me of course when i was little and i ended up being her carer a lot um but the one thing she did do was give me this fantastic bravery in thinking bigger thinking outside the box and also trying to distract people from what was going on over there with her to what was happening here with me because i had a story i could entertain them i could make them feel happy and and hopefully forget the woman in the corner trying to steal somebody's dog or eating all the food off their plate in restaurants yes that did happen um and uh, so she, she was she was an inspiration for me although at the time of course it was like hugely embarrassing uh, just to give you a couple of examples she she once started eat, making me eat porridge, which I, I loathed. And, um, and I said, I want it like my friend has it. Like she had sugar and milk in hers. And so mom said, I'll make you the porridge that you should be eating. Salt and water. Yep. It was like wallpaper paste. It was awful. So I didn't eat it. Um, and then two minutes later at school, uh, the, the door opens, in comes mum with a bowl of porridge, slams it on the desk and says to my teacher, I want Sonia to have eaten this before she gets home and slammed out again. So all the kids, of course, I was six at the time, all the kids were like, no, 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 your mum's crazy. And I thought, yeah, she is. And I want to distance myself from her. So that was a lot of it. But at the same time, loving her, of course, because she was my mum, and finding ways to cope with that sort of behaviour that was happening two or three times a day. So you, you, learned, you had to learn very quickly, or I certainly did, how to create a coping strategy. And, and mine was being humorous and entertaining and turning the things that she did into stories that would make people laugh rather than make me collapse into my own mental health quagmire um, as it were so and it's mental health awareness week this week so it's it's fascinating for me that um so many people read the blog um literally i started posting as silva will remember i started posting little snippets of conversation i had with my mum after she was finally um put into a care home under lock and key and i've spoken to maxine about this as well um she she was arrested because she was um threatening a teenage gang in the park with a toy pistol and um, telling them to go home and get jobs yeah really good um and of course um they didn't take kindly to this and uh, and so the gang started following her and were probably going to beat her up luckily a neighbor saw and called the police and so she was then put into care and she was 80 years old and it was the first time she'd ever been diagnosed she had six mental health conditions that had never really been addressed so she came from a generation of women who would never talk about mental health because it meant that a they might be locked up in an institution in a white coat um, and secondly she'd have her children taken away and to be honest a lot of the stuff that she did when me and my brother were little today you would have 
probably had them taken away. I mean, she, I find it funny now looking back, but say there was a, we'd be on our way home from, from swimming and there would be um, uh, uh, cars waiting at the bus stop or cars waiting at traffic lights. She'd open the door, push me in the back of a car and say, take this little girl back to Hendon. And that was it. I'd be in the car, the car would go, mum would disappear. And this driver's going, what, what just happened? <laughs> I would have to get me home. So the, all those things became things that in later life I started to realise were actually her loving me and trying the best she could to look after me. Whereas at the time it felt different. Um, and this is what a lot of people are finding from reading the blog. And uh, I went on the Jeremy Vine show a couple of years ago. I know Jeremy Vine from other side of TV and he got me on Radio 2 to talk about it, this sort of lost generation of women um, who would never have spoken up about their mental health and maybe their support wasn't there, this was in the 60s and 70s um, and we were deluged with people suddenly thinking that maybe the bad behaviour bad behavior of their parents or sibling might not necessarily have been them just deliberately being a nuisance or embarrassing them that maybe there was mental health there mental health issues that weren't addressed properly so it's become a real vessel for people sharing their own anecdotes um, and i encourage people to have a big conversation we're talking about communication now across barriers and mental health is one big barrier um, to communication and I think of a lovely quote that somebody said that communication is the bit in between confusion and clarity and so the confusion that was going on with my mum was immense but I, I sat her down and said to her mum I want you to know I never knew how ill you've been for the last 70 odd years 80 years that I've known you um how will you've been but you've done the most fantastic job you've been a brilliant mum look I'm healthy I'm married I've got a great job I love you you love me it's brilliant you know I've been a terrible mother I said no you haven't been a terrible mother you've been a brilliant mother you've done everything you could to love and look after me and I want to say thank you and there was a little moment and it just logged in and she got it and from that moment on we could then enjoy the most fantastically open loving mother-daughter relationship without the guilt and the backstory and and I would encourage people if they can to sort of have those little mini conversations with the people they love um, and that sort of, that gave me the impetus to write the blog as I say that became a sort of bigger bigger picture and that 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 became um, something that a couple of publishers came to me and asked me whether we're not the guy to write a book about it. Um, and, um, and, and it made me realise that were it not for mum's amazing behaviour, I wouldn't have been the creative, brave person I am. I mean, I, I go into commissioner meetings and sometimes a commissioner will tell you at TV, we want famous people to go on passion journeys. And I think, hmm, how about someone you've never heard of who doesn't want to go anywhere? <laughs> And they look at me as if to say, have you read the brief? I go, yeah, I have. But maybe you haven't thought yet about what it is you don't know you want. Um, and so we presented an idiot abroad to the Sky and they just said, well, this is, this is exactly what we haven't been asking for, but it's exactly what we should have on the, ch on the channel. So that was, a, I said, like, yeah, thanks, mum. You gave me the bravery to do that because, you know, no conversation, no situation is ever going to be as embarrassing for me as what it was like when mum was kicking off in the corner. It's just never. She'd push me in front of brides and say, stand there and have your picture taken. I was four and I'd be like, oh, don't know these people. I don't want to be here on my picture taken. <laughs> and there's probably all these brides in the sort of late 60s thinking, who's this little girl in the picture? We've never known who she is from day one. Um, but nothing is embarrassing because if you have a mother or somebody like that in your background who has given you this amazing skill to be confident in your own communication style, then I think that's a, a massive thing going forward. And that's always, and as Sylvia and Katie said about my background in TV, I've worked a lot with presenters, difficult ones, lovely ones, First time presenters have never done anything before on screen or on radio. Um, and I think it was just because I have 
an empathy gene in me. I can see things from different people's points of view very quickly. I had to do that when I was little. I had to see what my mum's behaviour was doing for my father, for the policeman, for the teacher, and see very quickly through their eyes what the, what the situation was. And so when you can see the world through other people's eyes, you can actually help them very quickly become more confident in themselves. So I do that a lot now, which I love. Um, and say media training, communication skills. It's all about the loudest voice in the room. This one, <laughs> this one telling you that people are going to think you're silly or stupid or that you don't know what you're talking about. You know what? You can be quiet now and you can go and sit in a corner. You've done a great job to get me here where I am, but you can just go and park yourself for a while. And that's what I teach people. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a little bit of practical experience of working in the TV industry and radio and working with, say, difficult people who I won't mention, but difficult people who would not be very happy to have a 20 something year old blonde girl telling them what to do when they were a 65 year old plus ex newspaper editor with their own show on radio too. work out for yourselves who that might have been. <laughs> so it's been it's been a fantastic creative journey and I absolutely love it as I say I love talking about my mum I used to make people not ever mention her if anybody used to say to me oh you're just like your mother I go oh don't say that and now I think yeah yeah because she was creative and fantastic and she was very loving and at her heart she wanted to do the right things and look after people she got it a bit wrong but hey don't we all so that's the message I talk about and, and I love hearing people feeding back and saying they might have had similar situations with with their parents or their mums their their siblings um, and also um, it's about making sure that when you communicate you communicate that bit in the middle between confusion and clarity because after all there are no real barriers to communicating only the barriers that you create yourself. So let's break those down, look at life from different angles, have a few laughs along the way, and, um, and see where you can go to make yourself a better speaker, which other, our lovely guests, the rest of the people today are gonna to be telling you a lot more about that. So that's where I sit, that's where I stand, sort of in the, the mental health um, awareness way of making sure that you're happy and you repair those relationships that might have been causing you problems in the past, have those conversations and move on. Um, and also, I will share a few celebrity anecdotes with you, but not here. <laughs> we'll save those for the breakout Sonia <laughs> well done thank you so much I love these sessions they are really vulnerable and we've had some amazing testimonials in recent weeks about you know so, so refreshing to hear, hear people's genuine stories in a frank refreshingly honest way so we've had that again from uh, from Sonia there thank you so much you. so yeah. next up we have Dr Harry Witchell Harry's a highly respected TV scientist and a communication and body language expert based in Brighton and Sussex Medical School. So Harry's best known for his appearances on Big Brother, Radio 4 and BBC News, where he presents practical and clear science for body language, music, dating, comms and that relationship between the mind and the body. Um, he's offering, and dying to hear this, knowledgeable, entertaining contributions to the media and, um, you know, one of Sylvia's really popular and brilliant speakers. So uh, over to you, Harry. We're looking forward to hearing that. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Harry Wittrell, and I'm a uh, discipline leader of physiology at Brighton and Sussex Medical School. And uh, I first have to apologize for my hair. I realize that everyone, I haven't been able to get a haircut for quite some time. So with that underway, let's talk about what it is that I'm interested in, which is the mind and the body. And I'm probably best known as a body language expert. So let's see how that works in a little, uh, a little experiment for you. So I'm gonna ask you to do some uh, things to notice. I'm going to get really close to my camera and I want you to look, really look at my eyes and see what you see and what is the difference between them. What can you see? So, some of you may have noticed that my eyes have brown in them, but they're definitely not brown eyes. You didn't get that they're brown eyes. Some of you would have noticed that there were a lot, definitely spots of green in them for sure, but they're not really green eyes either. What I'm trying to say is that 
somehow within the way that we judge the world, the way that we understand the world is based around instantaneous moments where we can take in information that we may not be completely aware of and yet be able to make sense of it and make decisions for this. So I'll give you a simple example. Up until this point, while I've been talking to you and also uh, in the previous talk, you probably were unaware of the temperature and also the pressure on your feet. Now let's say, for example, now that I've mentioned it, you probably are aware of this, whether you're wearing shoes or what have you. Now let's say for argument's sake that I was, say, not Harry Witchell, but Harry Potter, and I had a magic wand, and without telling you, I suddenly whiffed my magic wand, and poof, suddenly, whatever clothing you had on your feet, shoes, socks, whatever, disappeared. Now remember, up until this time, you've been getting little messages from your feet all the time saying, temperature of feet is this, this pressure on my feet is this. And you've been getting this information and ignoring it all the time. And yet, if I suddenly poof, made, the, made the, your, that change so that whatever you were wearing on your feet disappeared, I guarantee you that in one second you go, wah, ah, ah, what happened? My shoes, my feet, what's going on? And that's because you're always getting this information and yet making careful, intelligent judgments, which tell you which pits of information that you need to be conscious of. So you're conscious of what I'm saying, and yet there's lots of information that are coming into your mind, which are influencing you without your being aware of it. This is what I'm talking about with body language. So a lot of what I do is talk about how body language affects people and what you can do about your body language. So for example, I mean, for little kids, I would give little lectures for say, students at the, between the ages of 18, 16 to 18 saying, how do you know what body language means? What to interview? What does it mean when you do this? That sort of thing. So, but for adults, I'm much more likely to talk about how to apply this kind of body language information to situations that involve more complexity. So how do you negotiate? How do you do mediation? Situations where there's more conflict. I'm really interested in this relationship between the mind and the body. And there is a fundamental, I think, there's a fundamental misunderstanding in the general public about how this works. Most people think that the body is out there and it's getting information from the hands, the eyes, the ears, and there's, these are all divorced from this magical organ called the brain. And the information goes into the brain, it's processed by the brain, and then it goes back out and it ha occurs in some sort of behavior. But what I'm, I'm gonna tell you and what I'd present in any talk is the idea that actually it's much more holistic. That is that your body is responding at all times to various parts of nerve, the nervous system that are going on throughout your body. That is that you respond to the way that you hold your body, that you are influenced by what's going on contextually around you. And that that affects not only you, but it affects all the people around you. So what I'm really talking about is communication. Not just communication between others, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, but the communication with yourself, how different parts of your body interact. So we often talk about things like uh, a gut reaction. It turns out that the nervous system inside your gastrointestinal tract is incredibly complicated and it's incredibly active. And yet we can't say verbally exactly what's going on, but it does have a profound impact upon what's going on, what we're aware of. Although I couldn't tell you exactly how my stomach is digesting, I can see, I can feel when my stomach is absolutely tight with fear. We can feel these things. And likewise, we can, through our uh, machinations in our minds, influence the rest of our body. So I'm talking about communication. I'll give you an idea about some of the kinds of communication that I talk about. So Sylvia would say, I give talks on loads of different things, really a wide variety. I'll just talk about two of the books that I've written so that you get an idea, just as a flavor of what I've done. So one of them is You Are What You Hear, How Music and Territory influence who we are. And I'm really interested in music and I was in bands for many years. And music is a great passionate influencer. It's a great communicator. But I don't spend a lot of time talking about things like uh, harmonics or even the precise nature of melody. I talk about how music affects society. We all are profoundly affected by music and we take on music as its role in society. So examples are things like church music. Have you ever been at a church and suddenly felt uplifted and felt that you were part of something bigger? That kind of effective music or army music. So large numbers of people have to get pumped up 
for doing whatever it is that they are going to do in an army. These kinds of relevant features of music are really important to me, and I view that as a way that music communicates between one person and another. And that all happens at a subconscious level. So it's something that people don't really think about or not necessarily aware of. So on the opposite level of that, I've written uh, writing for biomedical sciences students. Now you might think, God, that's really obscure. Why would anyone want to be interested in being writing like a biomedical scientist? Really, this isn't about just biology. It's about the opposite end of communication. So opposing this completely unaware communication that we have with body language, which is implicit and goes in through, the, goes in through your eyes and you might be aware of it, but wouldn't be able to say how you're affected. When we talk about how scientists communicate, they communicate with a kind of gravitas, a kind of explicit communication. And this really comes down to something called critical thinking. So not a lot of people really, everyone talks about critical thinking, but not a lot of people know what critical thinking is. Critical thinking, the opposite of critical thinking is not no thinking. It's not impulsivity or being unable to think at all. Critical thinking is only one way of thinking. The most obvious other way of thinking is intuition. Have you ever made a decision based primarily on intuition? I know a lot of people do. And intuition is a really valuable way of thinking, making decisions, and also working your way through life. However, it's not always perfect, and it's not always the perfect thing, particularly in situations of really high conflict and disagreement. So when I talk about what's valuable in intuition, so you, the one thing you wouldn't want to do with critical thinking, so as an, as an academic, why would I talk about critical thinking? Well, I don't think you need to do a lot of critical thinking about, is it time to wash the dishes now? I think that's a waste of your time, that spending a lot of time using critical thinking to worry about things like, that things that you could easily do very quickly is really not appropriate. That's where intuition comes in. And I'm happy to talk at length, and I have talked at length, about the role of intuition in decision-making, how we make decisions using intuition, how it's valuable. But there's also this, these times where people need, particularly in large organizations where there's a lot of uncertainty, people need a way of discussing things and thinking in an explicit, controlled manner where evidence is important. And this is what critical thinking is about, is making sense of a complicated issue, such as, let's say, with something like negotiation or with mediation, where people might even have different value systems. And these kinds of different situations require a more critical approach, a way that people can communicate how to get through conflicts in a way that's successful. So that's a lot of what I do. So why would you need to make these kinds of decisions with critical or, or intuitive thinking? And a lot of that comes down to what I call credibility. Credibility is the ability to transmit both how trustworthy you are and the meaning of the trust, whether or not people can act upon what it is that you're saying. So for example, when you're talking about trust, a lot of what people are interested in is whether or not you're being honest. But honesty isn't the only aspect of trustworthiness. Expertise is also important. So when people are expert, when they have, if they, so I guess you could say it's the difference between being willing and able to communicate what other people need to know. So it's all very well to be honest, but if you don't actually know what they're talking about, if you're not really able or expert enough to say that, that's a different matter. And it doesn't matter how honest or willing you are to communicate. And getting across to people that you are both willing and able to provide the information and to understand what it is that needs to happen in the future is part of how people discuss what needs to happen in the future. So that's how people go forward. So, Essentially, that's what I have to say. I mostly talk about nonverbal behavior, but I talk about all forms of communication and how people interact. Mostly I do, well, I do a mixture between training, TV, and entertaining talks. And I can do uh, dinner talks as well. But a lot of it, I also do these weird things that are experiments where I can go on a TV and also I can do things uh, with where people make judgments as to whether or not people are buying stuff. So I will go into companies and show them what, how people are responding to their advertising. So for example, I do very careful adver uh, advertising analyses where we look at people's body language as they look at a screen. 
So I can, I look at people and see if they make little tiny movements like this, just tiny little millimeter forward movements. And from that, we can gather whether or not people are responding to different kinds of communication. I know that's fairly obscure and academic, but some people, some companies actually like to have this kind of moment by moment information at a detail as to what it is that people are thinking and how people are responding. And I'm, I'm mostly interested in understanding how people respond and also communicating to you how you can get the responses you want by using either confidence or whatever it takes to communicate what you have inside you at your best level for the context that you're in. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Harry. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. And we haven't rehearsed this at all. We've got together to make sure Zoom worked and we could all see each other, but you've queued up my presentation perfectly. So uh, thank you very much for that. So yeah, I'm up next and I'm Katie King and I'm probably the only one today that has any slides. And I just wanted to uh, share a couple of thoughts with you. So I'm going to um, share my screen and pull up a couple of slides to talk you through, just to give you a, a little bit of background. Um, so I'm Katie and I am originally from Tottenham in North London, working class family, born on the 11th floor of a block of flats up here in Tottenham. And you know, communication really is what, in a social mobility context, what's got me to where I am today and where I want to go in the next 20 years. So I've spent all of my career helping major high profile business leaders, particularly men, uh, Richard Branson and many, many others, Microsoft, Harrods, um, you know, O2, Orange, all kinds of organizations. I've helped them with their communications. I've been the voice behind their editorial, whether that's on Sky, Financial Times, The Sun, all kinds of areas. So I'm a PR expert and a communications expert. Um, but I'm 53, and when I got to uh, 50 three years ago with all the hormones of the menopause raging, it felt as if everyone had caught up because I had carved out a really nice communications niche for myself as originally a marketing expert and PR, and then for 12 years, a digital marketing expert at the cutting edge, talking about Twitter and Facebook on TV and radio before everybody had really caught up with it. And then all of a sudden, every man, every woman and his wife was a digital marketing expert. They were half my age. They were in London. I was in sunny Tunbridge Wells out in the sticks. And I needed something new. So I've always been a, a very natural speaker and, and very honest. And, you know, I am there, like Harry just talked about, in terms of confidence and credibility, but also expertise. And it didn't feel as if there was enough of a USP of a unique selling proposition anymore because everybody else seemed to be claiming that expertise. And so at late 40s, I went away and spent a year researching a book. And so one of my opening lines with a lot of uh, speeches and um, talks that I give is that I'm here to protect you all from extinction. And it's true because as you've seen in the recent days, m and talking about, you know, the fact that the high street is never going to be the same again. Yesterday, there was talk that artificial intelligence needs to be on the board of every company and that the future, you know, being AI futurists is a really important job. And so I went away and I spent a year getting to grips with what artificial intelligence and other fourth generation technologies are wrote the book, came out a year ago. It's just been translated into Chinese, Russian, and, and a number of other languages. So I guess what I'm saying really is that it's important whether you are um, a mum at home and you're thinking about getting back into the workplace, whether you're like me and you've got 30 years of business experience, you feel you're maybe in a rut. All of us need to be on a journey of lifelong learning and we need to be great communicators and we need to have an amazing personal brand. So whether that's TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, any of those, especially now, many, many people are being made redundant and you know we don't know what tomorrow looks like in terms of our customers, whether they're going to be in the same jobs or not. So I think all of us need to really get to grips. We don't all have to go out there and learn about AI and go and write a book. I needed to do that 
And for me, it's a bit of a legacy. It was a bit of a pushing myself out of my comfort zone and wanting to write a book. But you certainly need to know about new technology. You need to be up to speed with the way that the world is changing because AI and tools like this are going to change every aspect of our lives, in our homes, in our kitchens, in our offices, whether we are, whether we're keynote speakers, whether we are lawyers, uh, marketeers, dentists, the technology is seeping into everything we do. And behind AI are all these new technologies. So we need to be able to understand, to grow, to learn, and you know, to keep building our own brands. So my book is a collection of case studies. And when I do my talks, when I'm on TV, radio, wherever I am, I'm trying to share along the lines of what Harry said there, building trust, but sharing my expertise with people, but packaging up in a really well communicated way that is empathetic, because I'm saying to CEOs or to people in the audience, it doesn't matter if you're 60 and you feel like this is the world of your grandchildren or even great grandchildren. You know, I'm not asking you to go and learn how AI works, but you do need to understand what it means and how it's going to impact your life and your jobs. And I pull all of this great um, knowledge from all the incredible speakers in my book, major case studies of brands like TGI Fridays, interesting academics, and wonderful new startup companies who are disrupting all aspects of business and life. And I've pulled it into this, this um, scorecard for success. Now, you could replace the word AI with COVID-19, God forbid, a future pandemic, or any kind of change. And this could be a scorecard which you all use to get you thinking about this. It's particularly relevant for business people, but it's relevant for us all as individuals as well. Number one is about mindset. It's about openness to change. It's about, in number two, having the buy-in from senior people. Number three, what's the business case? Don't just jump on the bandwagon of the next technology movement. Understand what problems you're trying to solve and then do experiments, do proofs of concept. concept. Number five is about collaborating. And I think in, in life and in business, sharing and collaborating with people is absolutely fundamental. Six and seven are fundamental too. We need to buy in the talent. We need to retrain ourselves. We need to buy in or retrain our own staff as well. And number seven is about communications. It's about culture. It's about understanding, you know, what are we in business for? That Simon Sinek, you know, it starts with why. What's our purpose? And I think as individuals and some of the positives that are coming out of the current pandemic, hopefully kickstarting um, greater movements towards, you know, green activity and less pollution and greater communication with our families and our society. So that's really important. And this continual innovation. Number nine, I sit on an all party parliamentary group looking at the adoption of AI and enterprise. And I'm just launching a really exciting project with schools. Phase one is in the UK. Phase two is going to be global schools. And it's about making technology like AI accessible to everybody, whatever their background, whatever their budget, you know, whatever race, religion. And I'm a really strong believer in that equality and access to education, whatever age you are. And then number 10 really is, what are we going to do with all of this? What is the, the roadmap for it? So when I speak, I like to um, share those sorts of examples. I like to make each of my sessions really tailored to my audience and communicate in an empathetic way. And one final thing I'd leave you with, as I mentioned a moment ago, is, you know, do a bit of work on your own personal branding. Think about, as Harry said, um, as Sun, you mentioned, how you communicate with people, how you present yourself. You know, we're all going to be in lockdown. We're certainly going to be working virtually like this for, for some time to come, probably even for another year. So there might be job interviews you're doing. You might need to brush up on your CV. Job interviews and recording video of your CV are really important. Your LinkedIn profile and so on. All of that is absolutely essential. 
So, you know, seek us out, whether that's for training, whether it's for keynote speaking, we'd be delighted, you know, to help you on that journey. So I hope that was uh, just a few insights on that. So final speaker this afternoon is Maxine Mawinney. She is a former, I'm sure many of you recognize her, a former BBC News anchor and communications expert. She brings an incredible 40 years of world-class journalism and broadcasting experience. So we're going to benefit from that hugely. An extremely skilled speaker, interviewer and communicator. Um, across a whole range of myriad of topics. So I think it's fair to say with, with Maxine, it's a rare combination of warmth, knowledge, authority, and experience, which you can use you know, with Maxine as your not only event, but also a conference host too, virtually and face-to-face. -face. Highly sought after, um, often used to share her memories of her days reporting in Belfast during the Troubles, um, the Walco siege, 20 years as a BBC journalist and a news anchor covering all kinds of events. So uh, let's hear next from Maxine. Thank you. There we go. Katie, thank you very much indeed. What a big build up. And I, I think um, I've some three hard acts to follow there, but I am Maxine Mawinney and I'm a communicator. I've been a journalist and broadcaster for 40 years, it's, I, I hate to say it, because where have those years gone? And during that time, I've covered probably some of the major stories around the globe. As Katie said, I'm from Belfast in Northern Ireland, and I was 12 when the troubles began. And I spent my teen years through that, and also my reporting career began in Northern Ireland. So instead of the, the girl reporter being sent out to the flower show, the girl reporter went out to the bombs. And I've got really vivid memories of my life during that time, including my mom and I being in a department store in the changing room. And I was trying on a skirt. And we were at the back of the store when the front of the store was blown up by an IRA bomb. So we all had to go out the back door, me still trying to put this skirt on. But I think when you look back at those memories, um, it, it sort of shaped what I was to become and also my career. Um, I wanted to tell stories. I wanted to tell the stories of people and of life. And that's what journalists are. We're storytellers. We are in between the information and the audience. And information alone is not communication. I could read you a list, but you need to tell the story to get that across, no matter what that story might be. And of course, it's completely factual. So I learned really quickly writing, speaking, broadcasting. When I was working at the BBC in Belfast, breakfast time started, which many of you might remember, Frank Boff and his sweaters and Selena Scott. And it was, it was a really strange time for a regional newsroom because we were part of this big event, but we weren't really. And the only part we were really doing was putting this little news segment. And you see it today, those, you know, they cross to a region for the news. It's all very slick, it's all lovely. Well, let me tell you, I was the first person to do the regional opt-out for the news in Belfast for breakfast time. I was in a cupboard, tiny cupboard, with this one camera and one light. And the auto cue were the A4 sheets of paper all sellotaped together. So I'm working it myself and it's all going terribly well. And I'm very nervous. My shirt is stuck to my back because I'm very young. And I'm in this cupboard, remember, with one light, which is very hot. What happens to sellotape when it gets hot? It's very sticky. So as I'm rolling this thing with my hand out of sight, it's all rolling up on top of itself. The sellotape goes into a big lump. There are no words. So I had to, luckily I'd written it, so I was able to remember it more or less and still do it. But when I look at today and the tools that are available now, oh, I wish I was starting again. Well, not really, because I had a great time in my career. So over the 40 years, I went from a very, very poor family. I was, I was a single mother and me and my two sisters in the back streets of Belfast, among the bombs and the shootings, to the top of the BBC to become one of their senior news anchors. And I did that by traveling around the world as a foreign correspondent, and single mother, I had two little daughters in tow. And to, when I look back on the career, the number of glass ceilings I had to break along the way 
My first day in the BBC newsroom in Belfast, I was a newspaper reporter first, then I went there. One of the male journalists, because it was all the real men, said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm the new journalist, I'm the new reporter. And he said, no, 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 there's a great job for a girl going in the library. So it wasn't terribly confidence building. But anyway, day two, I go back in again and the guy says, same guy says to me, oh, you're back. Oh, well, don't be having ambition. You have a Northern Ireland accent. I went around the world as a foreign correspondent and I made it to the top as a BBC news anchor, but you had to push. So one of the things I discovered throughout my career, particularly from a woman's point of view, there, was, there were gender walls, there were glass ceilings, and you had to really push to get through them. And sometimes it was really difficult. But one of the things that I was taught by my English teacher actually was to always say, yes, of course you can do it. Have confidence to do it. And that's what I did. Sometimes I said yes, thinking, ooh, really? But I did it anyway. And it was, it's something that has stayed with me and particularly for women and young women who maybe don't have the confidence, you can do it. So when I do a lot of keynote speaking and pull in the parts of my career where I've had to be resilient, I've had to maybe go slightly against the grain and I've had to put myself up into vulnerable positions, all that experience I can bring to a talk about those aspects of life. And it's really interesting um, as a woman doing it because when I became 60, I left the BBC, actually when I was 59, I chose to leave. And I decided that 60 was a turning point in my life. I it was time to do something else. I've been reporting for 40 years. So just listening to what Katie was saying was quite interesting. I launched myself onto the internet with a YouTube channel of 15 minute interviews from all walks of life. And I see Dickie's here. Dickie, we've spoken. Sonia, we've spoken as well. And it's a really, um, at the time for me, it was a whole new world. But again, it was something I thought, I'm gonna embrace this. And it was terribly successful. We're on hi hiatus at the minute, obviously, because we're all locked down, but hopefully it will come back at some point. During my career, I traveled all over the world. So I was the Reuters news editor in Asia, based in Tokyo with my two little girls. And I covered everything from New Zealand to India. And that was a huge job in terms of managing people and time. But the biggest obstacle was in, when I went to um, other agencies and, and TV companies within Tokyo, maybe to do some negotiation. And I had a translator. And again, it was all men. This was 1990. I was a rare breed at that point. And I would go into these meetings and I was completely ignored. And I went back to the office one day and said to one of the team, what is it? What can I do to make myself heard? They said, you need to change your translator from a female to a male, and then they'll listen to you. So then I did. And suddenly I was somebody to be spoken to because I had a man working for me. So again, those, those blocks that you had to overcome in those days, there are similar blocks today, it's perhaps it's with slightly different views, with slightly different look. We've got gender pay gaps, we've got pay quality, all of those things. And for women, they're really difficult. I covered some of the biggest stories in the world in my career. The Clinton presidency, now there's one to talk about. Bill and Monica, for instance, I could tell you a tale or two. Come to one of my talks and you'll hear them. The other stories that I covered were the, you might remember the siege at Waco in Texas with the Branch Davidians. We had to live in a field for three weeks for that because the state troopers in Texas let us in, but they said, if you go into this field beside where all this is happening, you can't leave. So there was a bit of a difficulty with underwear and there was also a bit of a difficulty with food. I'm not going to go into toilet facilities, that's a bit different. And the Salvation Army ended up coming in to feed the press corps on that one. Other stories included O.J. Simpson. You remember that court case. If the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. Johnny Cochran and Robert Kardashian, father of the famous Kardashian family. He was the co-counsel on that for O.J. Simpson. The other stories were things like the Oklahoma bomb, which was really tragic and really affected me because as a mother, one of the first pictures to come out of Oklahoma, you may remember, is a firefighter carrying a baby. 
So where the journalist is between the information and the audience, and you're basically in a zone usually getting the information and you are not supposed to be emotional or you're not supposed to be biased, which is generally what happens. But when there's a story with children such as that one, I would feel it personally. And I would feel really strongly that those stories had to be told. So one of the things that I do, I'm trying to stop it, it's my timer, I shall put it over there so that I don't overrun. One of the things that I like to talk about on my talks, uh, Sylvia knows, I like to talk about the, it's really annoying, isn't it? Give me one second. No, it's not gonna go off. It's off. Katie, I need a lesson in technology. One of the things that I like to talk about, or several of the things, are my career, which is very life empowering and will also encourage, I hope, and um, help other people, that career path and the choices that you make, those crossroads that you take. If I'd gone one way, it would have been completely different. If I'd gone another way, a bit like sliding doors, the movie. I also like to host and interview because when you think about my career, I'm basically a consummate interviewer. I love interviewing people. I've done it live all of my life. I like to know, I like to get that information from them and tell their story through their words. I love hosting events. I'm ruthless. I keep everybody to time. So whether it's your panel debate or I'm actually hosting the entire thing, you will run on time because I'm pretty ruthless about that. I hate sitting in an audience and it's all going over. And on that note, so that I don't run over, I'm going to say thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Maxine. Brilliant insights there. And again, another really vulnerable, open, honest set of insights that I know we'll all learn from. So um, what we're going to do now, as I mentioned at the beginning, is Ashley will put us into two breakout rooms. Just to say we've re been recording all of this, so we can make that available. Sylvia will be posting that over LinkedIn and elsewhere over the coming days. As we go into the breakout rooms, we will be taking some screenshots. So if any of you are unhappy with that, just turn off your, your webcams, but I'm sure you're all used to that now. So we will be sharing those because they're brilliant for following up, for advertising the next webinar that's coming along too. So thank you so far to, to all of the other three speakers, brilliant. And what we'll do is we'll go into our two breakout rooms, 10 minutes each one, come back into the main room, do a bit of wrapping up and then let you get back to the sunshine. So uh, see you all in the breakout room shortly. Thank you.